taught in the Africana Studies program at Master College prior to John Jay. She is a civil rights attorney who litigated cases for the Southern Poverty Law Center in Alabama, Community Legal Services in Philadelphia, and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Professor Ronald Marshall is the author of many articles and several books, including The Voting Rights War, the NAACP, and the Ongoing Struggle for Justice, and Race Law and American Society, 1607 to Present. In her free time, Professor Brown has completed the New York City Marathon, as a published playwright, and is working on her first novel. Please welcome Gloria Brown Marshall. Thank you so much. As you can see, the marathon might be postponed this year. <laughs> we will see. But I thank you so much, um, and I thank you, Gary and Denise, uh, for all your kindness and for coming here for, to hear about how racism impacted the suffrage movement. I thank the Harding family for being here. They've been so very kind to me. And I appreciate the invitation. Warren G. Harding's symposium um, is branched out in so many different places. So many different people from around the country know about um, this symposium. And I am honored to be a participant. For many of us, earlier this week, we've seen um, the Trump White House and um, Donald Trump in particular vilify Representative Ilhan Omar, Democrat from Minnesota. We've seen him vilify and others send back, send them back, send her back chants at Trump rallies. Ayanna Presley, Democrat from Massachusetts, Rashida Tlaib, Democrat from Michigan, and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, Democrat from my state of New York. Before that, it was Maxine Waters and many others. These black women, primarily, have fallen within the crosshairs of political power. It's not the first time. Because African American women, and you'll hear me use black and African American interchangeably, are politically powerful and have been for quite some time. And I say this not just because I'm a very proud African American woman, I say this because history should bear me out. The increase in political power among African American women and the backlash to that increase is something that has been going on for centuries. And the backlash to African American progress generally has been a part of this nation's history since before its inception. This political power is such that it can change the outcome of an election. There was a question yesterday, why would there be this hesitancy around African American women and the vote? Well, you're going to see this, and I'm glad that I have a chance to respond to that question. Because there is such political power in the black community, and that political power is rarely discussed in open conversation. And that's why I'm so pleased to be here to have such an open conversation. The pattern is a rise in either political power or the precipice to political power, and then a backlash to undermine that progress. Warren G. Harding inherited a time in American history when that was happening. He inherited the time period we know as the Red Summer. The Red Summer of 1919 was a time of the nadir, the lowest point of racial relations in this nation. It was a time period in which we had race riots in South Carolina, Texas, Washington, D.C., East St. Louis, Chicago, Arkansas. We had lynchings around the country. Please note, there have been over 4,000 recorded lynchings in this country. And a lynching is not just a murder. A lynching is meant to send an horrific message to the community. Grown men burned alive, but before they were castrated. Boys hanged in public display, where they would have picnics afterwards. Any of you can go online and see the photographs of the white mobs 
smiling gleefully below a hanging black body. So in 1919, 76, 76 people were lynched in that one year. And this included women. Many of you grew up with this idea that um, black men were lynched because they had raped or tried to rape white women. This was a lie made clear over a century ago, but people still cling to it. So I'm gonna go back and not just talk about this 100th anniversary of the Red Summer of 1919, but we're also mixing this, as you will see, this is the 100th anniversary of a Red Scare of 1919. When socialism and communism, the, the mixture of the immigrants coming in, we're talking about um, Italians and the Irish in this sense that when they questioned, as did um, Congresswoman Omar, some of the policies of the government, they were seen as undermining the government. So there were attacks on those people back then and this is the 400th anniversary of the arrival of 20 Africans into the Virginia colony. So in order for me to best set these things in historical context, to better understand the political power of the African American community and how far back the backlash goes to that power, let's go back to 1619. And I'll tell you, as people go, oh, 1619, how long will this 400-year history lesson take? It will not take 400 years. <laughs> <laughs> the Virginia colony was founded in 1607 by King James. Those of us who know the King James Version of the Bible is that King James. It was founded in 1607. England was late to the New World and trying to expand its its political as well as economic power around the world. Portugal, Spain, France had already beaten England to founding these colonies around the world. So by 1619, Portugal, for example, had entered very deeply into this area now known as Angola. And for full disclosure, I was in Angola doing research for my next book this past April, I was there and I was studying Queen Nzinga. How many of you are familiar with Queen Nzinga? Let me tell you about this fierce African woman and you'll have a sense of how long African women have been fierce, have been powerful. And what we need to understand is just because you don't think we're powerful or history doesn't depict us as powerful doesn't mean that we believed any of that hype all of this time. <laughs> In our minds, in our conversations, in the way we see ourselves, we have been those people who are descendants of a very powerful, distinct, and wonderful culture, and living in a life that we believe could be made better if there wasn't gender and racial segregation and, and um, racial oppression, but at the same time, enjoying the life that we've been given. And that's what Queen Nzinga was doing in what we now call Angola in Africa. When the Portuguese arrived, her father was the Angola, the king. And he used to have the leaders of this area that we now see as Angola, the Congo. He was leader of all of that. And they would come to him for advice and counsel. She watched this as a little girl. She had a little brother named Mbandi. And Bondi, of course, as it is supposed to be under these types of ascensions, he was supposed to be the leader when the father passed away. But it was Nzinga who showed this sense of the future and watching the Portuguese come to negotiate, first negotiate as one leader to another, and then start to demand servants. As the Portuguese came in with weapons and the Africans had knives and spears, the superior weaponry drove the Portuguese deeper and deeper into Africa, always demanding more servants because the Portuguese had decided that there would be this place that they would expand as a threshold we now know as Brazil. When you look on the map, Brazil is here, goes straight across the Atlantic, 
That is Angola. It is almost as though the Portuguese got in a ship and said, I wonder what's over there. <laughs> and took their ship straight across and they find the region and the, the area then known as Ndongo. So at that point, what started off as diplomatic relations turns into strife. The Portuguese then begin to arm these other leaders against the king. And where we have to think about, here is Nzinga watching this as a little girl, watching her father lose power. Finally, when her father passes on and Mbondi takes over, he's a playboy. He's not prepared, he's immature. Nzinga had been studying combat with the men. I'm telling you, we're some bad people here. Okay. <laughs> she was better at combat than many of the men. So she not only inherited the throne or the stool, they called it then, but she was a diplomat after watching and studying under her father and a warrior in her own right. And so th two things happened that I need for you to understand that are overlapping. As the Portuguese now demand servants and override the power of the king and over the brother in Bondi, who was too immature to really find a strategy, there are ships leaving Angola, ships with Africans in the hold to be sold in Mexico. One of those ships is captured by an English privateer. That ship then gets into this battle on the high seas. The other ships are injured. One ship, as I said, actually survives. The English privateer, the treasurer, boards that ship and takes the human cargo. And they're in search of a place where they can go because their ship has been wounded as well. They're trying to find the closest English port. That closest port is Jamestown. And so that's how we have, as John Roth records, who was secretary of the Virginia colony, 20 and odd Negroes enter Virginia in August of 1619. So we have the entree of those Africans. And remember, 1619 is a year before the Mayflower. We were here before the Mayflower. I don't know if they taught you that in school. <laughs> But something else is also happening. Queen Nzinga sees her brother can't handle the Portuguese. So meanwhile, back in Angola, Queen Nzinga is the one sent by Mbondi, her, bro her brother, to negotiate a peace treaty with Governor de Sousa of Portugal in 1622. So here she is, even today, you don't even see women negotiating these treaties. Angela Merkel is like someone you'll see in negotiating a treaty. Here it is in the early 1600s, an African woman is negotiating a treaty with the governor of Portugal. And what's more interesting than this, picture this meeting. These Portuguese are seated and, and Queen Nzinga enters, and she has her maids with her who have oiled her body and given her the gold and jewels that the Portuguese were there originally to find, gold. And then they look at her as she stands, and she's looking around for a chair. Can you imagine going into a meeting to negotiate and there's no chair? She is expected to either sit on the floor or stand while they talk to her about peace negotiations, about metals, and of course, about men, women, and children they could take as servants. Queen Nzinga turns to her maid servants, and they know exactly what to do. One comes forward and falls down, her hands, palms pressed to the floor, and Queen Nzinga sits on her back, and that is from which where she negotiates this peace treaty. She says, I was born with a stool. How dare you deny me one, but no matter. This is the fierce African-American women, the DNA through which we find now the story of African-American women, the story of what they want as self-actualized people 
in a community that does not see their full humanity. But as I told you, that did not deny them their belief in their full humanity just because the law and the rest of society chose not to see it. So in 1619, we have these 20 Africans arrived, men, women, and children. Of these 20 Africans and other Angolan Africans who are now brought into this Virginia colony for this 400th commemoration that we're all a part of right now, Mary and Anthony Johnson. Mary and Anthony Johnson marry, legally marry. They are indentured servants, and, and this is very important. There were no slave laws in the colony at this time. So these Africans do not come into the colony as enslaved people. And there's a lot of debate around, well, didn't they assume they could be slaves? Well, my area is legal history. And if you don't have a law, then it was not legal. But laws were created later. And here's what happens with Mary and Anthony Johnson. They are considered indentured servants, just like the European indentured servants, or they used to call them white slaves. They were indentured under contract for a number of years, seven, nine, 13 years, where they had to work for free. But once that contract ended, then they were allowed to go out and get their own land and be completely free and a part of the colony. So initially, these people were considered indentured servants. So Mary and Anthony Johnson completed their indenturement and then married and had land of their own. Now, if that is not enough for you, hold on, buckle your seat belts. Not only did they have land of their own, Mary and Anthony Johnson, these Angolan Africans who are in the Virginia colony, had servants of their own in the 1600s. Let me let you take that in. Okay, here's the other part. They had white and black servants in the 1600s white and black servants in the 1600s. Now, 1619 was also the beginning of the House of Burgess. That is the governing body for the Virginia colony. Now, this creates a perfect storm for oppression. Why? Because this governing body, in order to be in politics, one had to own land. In order to vote, one had to own land. And so now this new crop has been developed. What is this new crop? tobacco and tobacco is very labor intensive and it requires a certain knowledge that has to be an ongoing knowledge that one would learn over time but the indentured servants contract would end how could they have long-term servitude hmm can we call it slavery and since the landowners were also the politicians and the lawmakers they created slave laws, little by little, creating these slave laws. So I want to do this now, and I know it's like, I know I'm the only black person in the room that somebody's passing in here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I want to just get this slavery thing out once and for all so we can better understand what slavery is. How many of you, when you worked, or if you're working now, were in a position that if your manager, boss, employer, whomever, could work you for free, would have? Raise your hand. If you would be worked for free by your boss, employer, manager, yeah, so that's slavery. That is, <laughs> so basically salary and slavery, but basically what I'm saying is this, that slavery is the ability to pass a law that says that I can get all the profits myself. Why pay you out of them? And it's greed. It's what it comes down to is basic greed. That if people could work you for free, they would. And once you start seeing slavery that way, and if you're in the best position that you are a landowner and you can increase your profits by having perpetual labor, Hmm, and these Africans are not covered by the English laws as are the indentured servants from Europe. Hmm, then I can have perpetual labor. Now, here's the other part of this. Not only can I have perpetual labor, but what about the children born? The children then become, and I say, watch the pattern of this. The children who are born in the colony become members of the colony. 
but we don't want them to have full rights. So what we're going to do is pass a law that says, and this is the case of Elizabeth Key, that's Elizabeth K-E-Y, E, sometimes spelled K-E-Y. Elizabeth Key's case was one in which her father was English and her mother was African, Black Bet. Well, um, um, it, that was uh, Black Betty, but her mother is African and at this point, the father leaves to go to England and he dies. She was left to work in a family home until her indenturement ended. When her indenturement ended, the owner of that home, the male there, the Englishman who's in the colony says, but you're of African descent because you have some African blood. So therefore, you are my, going to be my slave, my perpetual laborer. She sues, which is something else black women have been doing for a long time. Bringing lawsuits, this is 1654. We've been suing people for a long time. I'm telling you, once you know the African-American female story, you'll go, oh, I see why. <laughs> you know, that because the, the pride in what we've done under such, 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 such circumstances is just amazing. Elizabeth Key brings this case. Initially, they say, yes, you should be a free person. Then they change their minds. They rule back and forth, and finally, they have to have legislation passed that allows her to be seen as a free person because her, her father was very proud of her. Her father did not hide the relationship. And I always like to say when it comes to, um, you know, back then they called them mulattoes, now we call biracial. As long as the two races have been together and sundown comes, <laughs> we've had biracial people. Okay, did everybody get that? <laughs> Two different races, sundown, nine months later, biracial people, okay? <laughs> so this is not new, but the idea of it was, how do we discern who should be the perpetual labor? We're gonna go by the one drop rule. If any relative in your family is of color, Native American or African, then you are no longer considered white. The only exception they made was for Pocahontas. It literally in the law of Virginia, they had a Pocahontas exception. If you were a descendant of Pocahontas and you could prove it, then you would not be considered a person of color. And that was the only exception that they made at the time. You know, so once again, when I say, if you're in here passing, I don't know, but we're gonna get to the passing rule later as well. So what the law did was say, um, if you are a child of an enslaved mother, then you are born enslaved. This is what they did. That way, the white fathers didn't have to pay any inheritance, did not have to take care of them, and could have this wall of law separating the child from the father's responsibility, going back to the point that was made earlier about paternity. So this has been going on a long time that this Englishman, then comes, becomes American, but we'll start, they're still English at this point, can have these children and have this separation of emotion and separation made by law. So the status of the child of an enslaved woman becomes instantly a slave upon birth. And that way they can have the perpetual labor that they need. And then it goes into chattel slavery. Bacon's rebellion did something very interesting when Bacon's Rebellion took place in 1676, poor whites, indentured whites, and Africans came together and they fought against the white elite. They felt they were not being protected against the onslaught of Native Americans. They felt their land rights were not being respected. And so they fought against the white elite. And when that happened, the white elite said, never again will we allow these two groups to come together because they're too powerful. So then the skin color issue comes into play. These poor whites don't have a lot, but we're going to give them something in pigment. We're going to say, because they are white, or European born at the time, it was, it was more geographic back then than the actual you know, race issue. But because they are European, then, they will be treated a little bit better. And they had these criminal cases where you had blacks and whites or Africans and Europeans who are accused of doing the same crime at the same time. 
The African's punishment would be harsher than the European's punishment. This began in the 1600s. So that's why I said what we're dealing with now as far as vestiges and remnants, this has been going on for centuries. Meanwhile, what's going on with the Johnson family, Mary and Anthony Johnson? Because since they have property rights, now they should be able to vote, right? Because you've never heard of Mary and Anthony Johnson, and what I like to say to my students is that we may disagree on the interpretation of the facts, but there should be nothing I'm saying to you that you cannot look up yourself on the internet or in a library, in some book. Mary and Anthony Johnson existed because they had a fire on their farm. A white neighbor, we suppose, burned down their farm. They couldn't pay their taxes and needed a tax abatement. They had to go to the tax collector's office and list their property. And that's how I know that, in the fact, I have no social life, that I go to the archives of, of Virginia and I study these things. And so you can actually go to those archives and look at the list of the property of Mary and Anthony Johnson to see that they own land. So how could they be prevented now from having a voice in their community that vote? The House of Burgess passed a law that claimed that Mary and Anthony Johnson, even though they had been there since, you know, the 16, 19 on, were aliens in the community. They passed a law that said aliens could not own land and they were driven, expelled out of Virginia. So we said, one step following, gaining political power, and then something happens to push them back. This is a pattern that we see happening time and time again. But there have always been those who would rise up. The first, for example, and this is what I've found, there might be others, Whitworth Cheswell. Ever heard of him? Whitworth Cheswell was elected constable of New Market, New Hampshire in 1768. 1768, Wentworth Cheswell. One of the things that we do in this country is either demonize certain people so they're seen in a particular light or negate to tell anyone about these other accomplishments so that you know nothing about the contributions of other people. And it's a way in which we can keep the myth alive that only certain people are worthy of full citizenship. So as we go through, we'll find that um, as the nation then decides to form itself in 1776, that was pointed out before the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson writes this document demanding freedom from England in the presence of slaves, in the presence of enslaved women. <coughs> Thomas Jefferson, as many of you know, because I'm sure some of you have gone to Monticello, in his relationship with Sally Hemings, yes, that she bore his children, don't come running after me, I might not be able to run fast, but I do have a crutch over here. <laughs> <laughs> that he had this relationship with Sally Hemings for years, that she bore his children, they've done the DNA test, it's not just me saying it. So once again, we have this contradiction, hypocrisy, schizophrenia. We have a psychiatrist in the house. We'll tell us which one it is. We have something, if you go back even uh, going forward a little more, we're in the midst of chattel slavery, and chattel means movable property. So these African human beings and some Native American human beings are considered property and movable property. They have no right to self-defense. That right to self-defense was taken away by the Virginia statute in 1680 that said that if any um, African man, woman, or child lift their hands against a Christian, and that meant against a white person, that they could be put to death. That meant that mothers could not protect their children, husbands could not protect their wives, you know, children could not protect their parents, and this was by law. And that's why we need to understand the role law plays in oppression that it's played a longer role in political oppression than it's actually played in political liberation. 
So when we get past 1776, and I'm going to give you some good news every now because I don't want people like feeling burden laden and depressed. By 1781, I want to give you the story of Mumbet. And Mumbet um, brought a case, the first successful case in 1781 to gain her freedom using the Massachusetts Constitution. Because in Massachusetts, they were like, oh, the Constitution, and she's listening to this. She couldn't read or write. She was a servant. She was an enslaved person. And the person she worked for, and this is, goes back to these conflicts between white women and, and black women, that goes way back. Because these white women had no power over their men. No woman was, was able to vote at this time. And women were considered to have the minds of children, that they couldn't have the responsibility of the vote. You heard all of that in the great um, presentation that was given by Professor Jealous. But here we have this other issue. What is the relationship between the white woman and the black woman? The competition, but also, remember we said this issue, the child of the Englishman, now of the American? Who do you think the father is? her husband. She has no power over him, but she has power over that woman who's giving birth and would treat her horribly to take out her rage at his infidelity on her. And this was something that, that has been a schism between white and black women for centuries that has not been re readily discussed that that rage and the selling of those children in order to spite her, to spite him. So now she's selling this child, a child by rape that this black woman still cared about on the auction block. So when we get to the, the um, Mumbet story of 1781, what we need to understand is there was also the sense of the freedom if those of us who ironed our own clothes and cooked our own meals, cleaned our own homes, had someone who would do all that work for us for free? Yes. <laughs> Think about how great that would be. Now turn it around and you're that person doing it for free. This is what we need to understand. That we had these black women that were not only working all day, they, the, the phrase is from can't see to can't see, from before the sun rose to after the sun set, and then being raped at night. This is the life this black woman had in many instances. Mom Bet was treated differently. She and her sister lived with a family. They were high level in Massachusetts, the Ashley family. He was a very high level person in the military and in politics. But, these, but Mrs. Ashley had a horrible temper. And she would take it out, not because there was any rape going on or anything like that. She just had a, a bad temper. And when she would lose her temper, she would beat Mumbet. And she would beat Mumbet's sister. And one time she picked up an iron. You know the irons from back in the day, the real heavy ones? She picked up one of those and cracked her on the arm cut it down, as they used to say, to the white meat. And it's then that Mom Bet decides she's leaving. As she's going to the store, she hears them in the town square. Remember, most people then are illiterate, so they would stand in the town square and give their speeches. And she's hearing the speech of freedom, and she decides that she's going to go to a lawyer. <laughs> and that's what she did. She went to a lawyer's office and said, if you mean what you say in this declaration you have, then I want my freedom. And this white male lawyer, let me get this straight too. There have always been white people who have stood up for what is just and right. Always. I wish there had been more, but they've always existed. Always. There's always been someone from one group helping another group. Always. And as I always say, I wish there were more. So we have this white attorney who represents Mum Brett successfully in the case of Brom and Bet versus Ashley. And she gains her freedom. Now, who was Brom? Brom is this African man because they said, you can't have this African woman bringing this case by herself. It doesn't look good. Let's go find a man to stick in there too and put his name first. 
even though he didn't do anything except, you know, lend his name to the case. But he ends up being free as well because they just couldn't let this African woman have her day in court and win successfully on her own. So you see how we, not only within the other communities, we have these issues as well in the um, African American community. I want to give you one more example of pre, um, uh, I would say the pre-Civil War era, and that is Oni Judd. Anyone familiar with Oni Judd? She is the escaped slave of President George Washington. People think, oh, not George Washington, chop down the cherry tree, can I tell a lie? Well, he, maybe he couldn't tell a lie then <laughs> when he chopped down the cherry tree, but what he used to do, because in Pennsylvania, where the, state, where the um, nation's capital was during the time of his um, presidency, they, the, the Quakers decided they would have a law that if someone escaped as an African into Pennsylvania, the Quakers would give them gradual freedom. And so that freedom would take over six months. If they had viable way of, of, of you know, taking care of themselves, they had income, they had a job of some kind, then the Quakers would set them free. So since George Washington had all of these enslaved people, not all of them, but many of them from Mount Vernon where his plantation was located, Every six months, he would take them back to Mount Vernon so that they would not become free under this Pennsylvania statute. So Oni Judd realized this is what was going on, and she decided to free herself. And so Oni Judd um, left George Washington's employment, and she didn't sneak out. She, actually, they were having dinner and she just went out the back door and kept going <laughs> and went to New Hampshire. <laughs> and that's where she lived the rest of her life as a fugitive slave in New Hampshire. And George Washington tried to go to New Hampshire. He sent people to take her back. He even put advertisements in the paper until someone said, you're like the president and this makes you look really bad. <laughs> so please stop doing this. And that's when he finally stopped trying to bring her back. Um, the Constitution was uh, drafted in 1787 and ratified in 1789. And in the Constitution, the states decide what the um, qualifications will be for um, the ability to, to vote for suffrage. But also in the Constitution, Article I is the three-fifths clause. How many of you have heard of the three-fifths rule? Yes. And so the three-fifths rule is a way of computing the number of representatives from a state to Congress. Many states, especially in the South, had overwhelming African populations. Overwhelming African populations. So it was, how, do we, how do we decide? And it wasn't based on political representation. It's not like they went to the slaves and said, how can I best represent your interests in, con in Congress? It was nothing like that. It was basically that we want to know how you should be counted. Of course, the North said you shouldn't count them as any. You're not representing their interests. They should not be counted at all. And if the South said, no, we want to count them as a full person, so the compromise was three-fifths. I went to the Library of Congress and asked the question, how did you come up with a fraction three-fifths? And they said they'd use three-fifths for other things, and everybody agreed on three-fifths, so Nobody bothered to you know, overset the apple cart when it came to that fraction. So there was nothing else deep about it. You also heard about the suffragettes movement that um, had this, uh, a high point in Seneca Falls in upstate New York. And over the July 19th and 20th in 1848, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, there were about 300 people there at that meeting, no black women. No black women, but there was a black man, and there were other men. Frederick Douglass. So Frederick Douglass, but what gets me about Frederick Douglass, and I, I've got these concerns, because Anna Murray Douglass, his wife, his African-American wife, could have been taken to the meeting, but was not. So, you know, as I said, these, these issues that African-American women have faced don't just include white men, white women it also includes black men. And other men, it's like when African-American women like Sojourner Truth, um, who said to other white women after um, the, the Declaration of Sentiments, and in this Declaration of Sentiments, as was pointed out, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal and that they are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. And, goes, and it goes on to um, set out those rights. 
Sojourner Truth, at the same time, if white women suffragettes were looking for black women to be a part of the movement, Sojourner Truth was not that far away. She was in upstate New York. She could have been somebody that they talked to, but they didn't. So there were a number of other very powerful black women, but Sojourner Truth was fierce. She's in that Queen and Zynga category. And Sojourner Truth lived from 1797 to about 1883. But in 1851, she's known for the speech, Ain't I a Woman? Ain't I a Woman? And I just want you to hear this speech because she went to a suffragettes, and I'm gonna say white suffragettes and black suffragettes. She went to a white suffragettes convention and she looked around and said, well, where are the black women? You know, um, ain't I a woman? Like, why am I not a part of this? She said, that man over there says that woman need to be held into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. Ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could heed me. And ain't I a woman? I could walk or work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne five children and seen most of all sold off into slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, all but Jesus heard me, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? So, I have my own version of this, and I put it this way. I love my mother like you love or loved your mother. Ain't I a woman? When we understand the common humanity of these women of African descent who have had to go through so much because in the Constitution, by 1808, the slave trade is no longer legal. So then how do we make product? We then have business meetings where plantation owners meet to decide how they can breed an African woman without breeding her to death. But ain't she a woman? The white suffragettes are not listening to this at all. There are some who are deciding on the standpoint of abolition because they say slavery is diabolical to marriages, the white marriages. Africans who are enslaved cannot be married because property cannot marry property. A desk cannot marry a chair. They do something called jump the broom and that's only with the permission of the slaveholder. But we have white suffragettes Lucy Stone, as I said, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucy Burns, Alice Paul, Lucretia Mott, Susan B. Anthony. These women are taking prominence with the temperance movement where they say, lips that touch liquor shall not touch these. The temperance movement. They believe alcohol is the core of the problem, but not slavery. We have a Fugitive Slave Act in 1850 that turns Ohio into a major underground railroad site as people try to escape through Ohio into Canada. But many don't know that Canada had slavery as well. So by the time we get to the Civil War in 1861, we have black suffragettes, we have white suffragettes. We have a movement in which we're now looking at the end of the Civil War that is only successful for the Union because of African soldiers. When President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, it freed Africans who are enslaved in the South. What did that do? Economically, that means no one is working the farm because the men are in the war, in the Confederacy. 
The other thing it did was these African men, women, and children escaped up to the North and became soldiers in the Union Army. Without these hundreds of thousands of Africans joining the Union Army, then the Union would have lost. If you have a chance, next time you're in Washington, D.C., go to the African American Civil War Museum and you will actually see the names of the African soldiers who fought in the Civil War. And that President Grant, then you know, um, General Grant, said without the soldiers, the, the North would have lost. So when the war ends and we have the 13th Amendment, the idea is these men did not just get freedom. It wasn't just given to them. They fought and died for it. Frederick Douglass even said, these men have earned their right to full citizenship. How are you going to deny them this right? The issue then becomes, what does full citizenship mean? Does it mean the vote? The white suffragettes are saying, wait a minute. The vote is ours first. Then we give it to black men. Others of just as racial, the bias as their men, are saying that black men don't deserve the right to vote. What do they know about the vote? They've been, you know, in these hostile environments, they've been treated as animals. How can they gain the type of political voice that would decide our futures? All of these questions are going on and of a concern during this time period. But the 13th Amendment is passed, but here's the crucial part. Neither slavery nor inv involuntary servitude, indentured servitude, except as punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery except as punishment for a crime. Now we have the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was needed because the Dred Scott decision of 1857 said that a black man had no rights, a white man is bound to respect. In order to give those rights back to, remember, the Africans who have been here since 1619, they had to amend the Constitution. That gave us the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, the first provision of the 14th Amendment, if you ever wondered where you get citizenship at birth, that is the first line of the 14th Amendment. It was given to the Africans because the Dred Scott decision of 1857 had taken it away, so they had to give that back. And then we shared it with the rest of you. So, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. That's where you get citizenship at birth. You also get privileges and immunities, equal protection, and due process. All of this is in the 14th Amendment, Section 1. But now, here comes the biggie. And the biggest debate was, do these black men get the vote before the white women? Many white women were up in arms. They protested. But at the end, the thought was, my mother. <laughs> of course. <laughs> she heard me. She, she felt me bring her name up. <laughs> I know. I love my mother. And she loves to love me. <laughs> no matter where I am. But what really is that the concern that I have with this is that this friction between white women and black men is something that carried through up until the first run for the presidency of Hillary Clinton. Okay? And this idea that they had been cheated because when black men gained the right to vote in 1870 with the 15th Amendment, it was this sense that at any point, if we're going to go ahead and support this black male vote, that at any point right after this, the women will also gain their right to vote. And it didn't happen. So the backlash was against the black male voters. The idea that these white women had been cheated and that black men have more power over a white woman than a white person should have over a black person. When you think about it, it's like in the hierarchy of things, 
A white person should be ahead of any black person, male or female. And now here this black man has a right to vote for and on laws that will affect the life of a white woman. The sense was, even in law, in the court system, in this time period, up until probably the mid 20th century, no person of color could testify against a white person. No person of color could be on a jury in which a white person was a defendant. Why? Because that meant that you could actually have some role in the fate of a white person. And we're talking about Asian, Latino, Native American. You are not allowed to control the fate of a white person. Of course, they can control yours and have been for some time, but no person of color was allowed to be in a position to control the fate of a white person. And so this anger was like, oh, these black men can control our fate. 1870, first black U.S. Senator Hiram Revels. 1870, first black U.S. Senator. You, people think it was Barack Obama, no, <laughs> no. There were black U.S. senators in the 1800s. Black U.S. congressmen in the 1800s. Black lieutenant governors, black people in the assembly and state assemblies. There were almost 4,000 black males in political office during this time period. But then 1877 comes as the end of Reconstruction. The federal troops are taken out but at the same time that these black men are rising up, the black woman is there organizing, trying to help the black community. We also have black lawyers, and this is very important to know, that Howard Law School was founded in 1869. 1869. So our first black female lawyer graduated in 1873. We have to understand how long this process has been going on. This was not something that happened in the 1960s civil rights movement. These movements have been taking place for centuries. And every time the progress is made, once again, the backlash. Now we have the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, the John Birch Society, and I call them other people with social problems where they can't join a group but decides to be terrorists anyway. So these people are now part of the backlash against the progress of blacks. There is a thriving black middle class. We have Howard University, we have Spelman College, we have Wilberforce, all of these, these Tuskegee Institute, we've had these places of higher learning and then by 1890, we see that something very pivotal is taking place. The power is such, remember said, people of African descent may not have been able to get their person in the office, but they could control the outcome of an election. This becomes the crucial point of the Colfax Massacre. The Colfax Massacre of 1873 in Colfax, Louisiana, where a Republican, and someone said the other day about the Dixiecrats, so the Democrats upset, or Republicans upset about Lincoln freeing, so-called freeing the slaves. Those Republicans in the South then become Democrats. But they're known as Dixiecrats because they're not true Democrats. They're, they're seen as people who have this vengeance mentality and vengeance in the law, vengeance in the social dynamics with African Americans, and very upset about their agrarian um, lifestyle being taken away from them. Because at that time, the South was an amazing place when it came to economics, but once again, if you had all these people working for you from can't see to can't see for free, think how much money you would have, what you could build. And so they had built all of this and lost it after the Civil War. And they took the revenge out on the African Americans who were in their communities. And with the um, federal um, troops taken away, um, with the change of the politics, we had this Colfax massacre. Some people see the Colfax case as a case that brought us the Second Amendment rights. But few people look at the case as the case of a massacre of nearly 300 black people. And the massacre begins because the Republicans win by a few votes. Remember, these African votes change the outcome of this election. And now the, the African um, Americans are meeting and they want to decide how they can best use their political power. 
white people hear about this meeting and all this, it's like, oh, they're planning an uprising. I always just fear black people plan an uprising. If we planned as many uprisings as we should have planned, we'd probably be further ahead. But <laughs> these white men then gather, a thousand of them, circle this, this courthouse and fire into the courthouse. Now, no one told them about friendly fire. No one said if you circle the courthouse and shoot, you're probably gonna hit somebody on the other side. <laughs> well, we're not talking about the brightest, shiniest pennies in the fountain. And so they actually kill someone on the other side. They're thinking the black people shot and they begin to fire all these people. They tell them, come out or we're going to kill all of you. They come out as prisoners and they gun them all down. And this is the Colfax Massacre. Once again, look it up, it's part of American history that no one tells you about. But the Supreme Court case that comes out of this gives rise to a protection of the Second Amendment. So after the Colfax Massacre of, of 1873, we have a number of other cases in which we have the black suffragettes and the white suffragettes, different camps, starting their own organizations, trying to, and the black women have this added cause, and that is the social cause, because their sense is not only do we need to vote in order to bring better resources into our community, we need to vote in order to protect ourselves. We need to vote for the prosecutor. Sound familiar? We need to vote for the mayor. We need to vote for the school board. We need to vote for these resources for our communities, because at this point, these people are not representing or protecting our interests. So that's why these black suffragettes are, are joining um, together to form these clubs. Um, I was going to tell you about Josephine DeQueer, another fierce black woman. And Josephine DeQueer brought a case. This one, I'm going to be totally honest with you. Josephine DeQueer, a Creole, Louisiana again, slaveholder. Slaveholder. She loses her slaves in um, the Civil War. She then, and she, this is someone who is one of the wealthiest, she's wealthier than most of the whites in Louisiana. She marries in an arranged marriage the child of the other wealthy Creole family in Louisiana. And they live this wonderful life until the Civil War comes. And most of the other people sell off their slaves for what they could get. She holds on to hers because she's not that kind of slave master. She's thinking of them more as servants. I had a chance to interview some members of the DeQuare family who are still living. And um, they, they still say that she was a good person, but you know, she wanted free labor, and so she had it. Here's my concern here. She brings this case because she's on a steamship, and you had the ladies only area. This has been an ongoing battle between white and black women. Once, not only ain't I a woman, but ain't I a lady? You had these certain areas that were separated for ladies so that they wouldn't be around cigar smoking, cursing men. And these genteel places for ladies, as a black lady, she wanted to enter. Remember, this is a, a, as a girl, she was educated in Paris. Her family was very wealthy. She had servants. So of course she wanted to go into the ladies area of the steamship. And um, she bought her first class ladies ticket, but they would not let her in. The white women would not let her in. And the area for, for blacks, all the men, women, and children were all crushed in one little area. They had these you know, hard wooden seats where they had leather seats here. They had one bathroom for everyone as opposed to a ladies bathroom. It was very different, very different, you know. And so this was the, the precursor to Plessy versus Ferguson that gave us separate but equal. This case, Hall versus DeQuare, goes to the US Supreme Court, and they said, and this becomes the crux of those people who are not told about the, the crux of separate but equal. If a black person and a white person were put together in the same place, that white person would become so enraged with having to share the seat with someone black that violence would ensue. So in order to maintain peace, the races must be segregated. But as long as they arrive in the same destination at the same time, then it's equal. Separate, but equal. So when we get to Plessy versus Ferguson, the 1896 case, Plessy is an octoroon. An octoroon is someone who can pass for white. And so he is a very proud black man. And he doesn't feel that he should pass for, for white in order to have constitutional rights 
that he gained in 1868. So they have these segregated cars. He sits in the white car. He's a civil rights activist. He's testing the law. He's arrested. The case goes to the US Supreme Court. They tell him he does not have enough votes on the court. You know, even now, you look at the court, the nine member court, you need five votes in order to win your case. The case goes to the Supreme Court. He argues that, that segregation violates his 13th and 14th Amendment rights. Remember we talked about those. 13th Amendment says slavery is abolished except as punishment for a crime. 14th Amendment gives privileges and immunities and equal protection. And the Supreme Court narrowly rules in this as far as their interpretation of the 13th and 14th Amendment. And they say basically that um, this badge of inferiority you think segregation gives you, that's in your mind. It's a psychological thing. The other thing they said is this is not about labor, so there's no 13th Amendment violation. Plessy is arguing, but it is about my right to decide my own fate. This sense that people of color are not supposed to decide their own fate, where they want to live, whom they want to marry, where they want to go to school, that this has to be decided by white people, but we have no control over your lives and what you do and where you live. It's a one-way street. This is what he's arguing and saying there's a violation of his 13th Amendment rights. Once we get through Plessy versus Ferguson, I want you to tell you, I want to tell you what, what happened politically. Prior to Plessy versus Ferguson, there was one lone black person in the Louisiana Assembly. Remember I told you, these people of African descent had been politically active all of this time, serving in the government. But little by little after 1877, and especially after the Colfax massacre, there was terrorism, all out terrorism, against black people voting and running for office. But we did it anyway, under peril of life and livelihood. So we have one lone dissenter in this uh, Louisiana legislature that votes against the Separate Car Act. By the time we get to um, 1900, where Louisiana had 130,000 registered black voters, 130,000 registered black voters in 1896, by 1900, there are about 5,000. They have been terrorized out of their right to vote because of Plessy versus Ferguson. So that's why when I started off saying this is the 100th anniversary of the Red Summer, of the lynchings in 1919, inherited by Warren G. Harding, I want to speak on two final things. Um, and one of them is that Booker T. Washington, who was seen as someone who was a, supposedly a supporter of black women's rights, did not support women's rights to vote. He was asked about his uh, position on suffrage, and he wrote this letter in December and of, of 1920. And unfortunately, he decided that he was going to say, dear sir, I'm writing to inform you of a case Oh, no, no, I wanted, I wanted to do something else. He wrote this letter, because I'm out of time. He wrote this letter basically saying that he believed in the question of women's suffrage, dear sir. Um, it is not clear to me that she would exercise any greater or more beneficial influence over the world than she does now if the duty of taking an active part in politics were imposed upon her. This is what Booker T. Washington says, the black um, leader of that time period. But we know that women gained the right to vote, black women gained the right to vote, and immediately, that's why I said the summer, the red summer of 1919 is so important. Because looking at the number now increasing of African American voting once women gained, black women gained that right to vote, you see the backlash of the lynchings and the rapes and the, the race riots taking place in 1919. It's this sense of we're going to terrorize you out of that right to vote because we so fear your political power. That one letter in, is, dear sir, and this is from Texas, I'm writing to inform you of a case of intimidation that happened to me. I live in River Junction, this is in Texas, registered in the 9th Precinct, but was asked to leave before it was time to vote. And this was happening to many black women across the South who had registered to vote. And in 1920, after gaining that right, were turned away from the polls. On Thursday, October 14th, 
Mr. Wilson and the deputy sheriff came to my house and told me that I was the leader of the colored people in the effort to have colored women register to vote. I am secretary of the Harding and Coolidge Club in my home. And I was active in all things that intend to uplift my people. On the following Thursday, which was October the 21st, Dr. B.F. Bond and the sheriff of the county, Mr. Gregory, came to me and after threatening me, on the 28th day, Mr. Heyman Dolan, Mr. Kramer, a mill owner, and Mr. Newberry came and told me, as there had never been a lynching in that part, they thought it well that I should leave at once to be sure of my life. So this is immediately after the 19th Amendment has been ratified and black women gain the right to vote. And I want to end on this. Um, President Harding had a chance to visit Birmingham, Alabama. And many of you know of his famous speech that he gave there. But the question around um, lynching was one that was on his mind. And here are a few quotes from that speech of October of 1921, October 26 to be exact, 1921. These things lead one to hope that we shall find an adjustment of relations between the two races in which both can enjoy full citizenship. I would say let the black man vote when he is fit to vote. Prohibit the white man voting when he is unfit to vote. Harding did not advocate for integration he did not believe that blacks and whites were equal, but he said, be the best possible black man you can be. W.B. Du Bois, one of the great thinkers, intellectuals, graduate of Harvard uh, with a PhD, studied in, in many parts of the world, Germany, France, and other places, wrote this of President um, Harding's speech. Harding's repeated emphasis that he was not calling for social equality or racial amalgamation means that the sensitive may note that the president qualified these demands somewhat, even dangerously, and yet they stand out so clearly in his speech that he must be credited with meaning to give them their real significance. And in this, the president made a braver, clearer utterance than Theodore Roosevelt ever dared to make or even William Taft or William McKinley ever dreamed of. For this, let us give him every ounce of credit he deserves. Thank you. Well, I want you to know I did mention Grant. I could have mentioned him, mentioned more about him, but I did say that it was General Grant who said that the um, African American soldier in the Civil War is credited with turning the tide of the war. But yet he did do so many other things. And Grant was also one criticized by the white suffragettes because Grant said he would support the um, black male right to vote before white women received the right to vote. Any other question? You had a question? I don't know if that's the appropriate form. Uh-oh. <laughs> I think, you know, I'm sitting here on the internet because it's in the news, and I think it needs to be talked about. And you're an attorney. I have a law degree. I don't practice. I'm a political social worker. But I've been thinking a lot about this, the whole reparations question. Because you know the right wing is going to use this as a dog whistle. It's already being used as a dog whistle. Oh, the scary Democrats and, you know, look at, you know what they're doing. What do you think about this? Can we have a discussion about this? Is this, is this something... I, I, reparations were um, requested, and it was an issue at the end of the Civil War. If you look up the name Callie House, C-A-L-L-I-E, last name House, you'll find that she started an organization right after the war ended to try to get reparations 
for Africans who had been working um, and for, for their labor. I think reparations is an important issue. I also truly believe we need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I mean, there is so much that the truth that's not discussed because um, people feel like their sensitive sensitivities will be offended by hearing just what I've said. And the fear of the, you know, the conversation, I think, outweighs the um, re reality of what reparations are. This country has given reparations in the past. It gave reparations to the um, Japanese who were interred during World War II. It's given reparations in some form to Native Americans in the form of actually paying the treaty demands even into the millions upon millions of dollars. Um, so reparations were not given in Tulsa, Oklahoma case, and it should have. When black people, it's like they said, okay, we want segregation. Okay, we'll stay over here, and we'll have our own communities, and we'll have our communities thrive. And when those communities rose above what whites had in the neighboring communities, the whites became jealous and would attack. This happened in Rosewood in Florida. It happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, it's happened in so many different places when black businesses would begin to thrive. And this sense of competition is one that goes back to the 1600s because these Africans arrived in 1619 from the hold of a slave ship that had a battle on the high seas. They didn't know the language, the culture, nothing, the economy. And then they rose up to get their own land, to become a part of the economy, to be a part of the culture and society. And at the same time, you had Europeans who were falling to um, diseases and not being able to get a foothold in the economy. And that jealousy comes up. So how do we deal with um, the rude awakening that sometimes people of European descent in America were not doing nice things to other people in order to stay on top? Once you get that, and see, nobody blew up. I just said that. Nobody was like, you know, I haven't left yet. But no one is like, <laughs> the whole idea that we need to understand in order for this country to be what it is, bad things happen to a lot of people. This was not some manifest destiny of God gave this to me because I was good and white. So we need to understand you can love this country, but you're going to have to deal with these issues because they're not going to go away. And I think that the reparations issue might be a dog whistle, but so was women's right to vote. And I want you to think about this. The Equal Rights Amendment is two states away from going up for a vote, two states away. And those, the last person who got the Equal Rights Amendment back and you know, brought life to it was a black woman from Nevada. The two women who are shepherding the Equal Rights Amendment right now through their states is a black woman from Virginia and another black woman from North Carolina. When we look at what happened in Alabama and how that Senate race was turned, it was a black female vote. Black women voted at a higher rate than any other group. Any other group, white women, white men, we voted at the highest rate. But my, what I say to my African-American sisters when it comes to political power, for too long we've been cheap dates. Cheap dates, cheap political dates. We are not asking for enough, given our political power, we're not demanding enough, and we're not giving consequences to people who undermine our political power. And that must change. That's another crucial de um, debate or conversation that needs to happen. Thank all of you. Thank you very, very much.